Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Mexico City talking trade with both business and federal leaders. Political reporter Brian Lilly stops by to discuss why tensions are heightened between the Trudeau Liberals and the Alberta government. And the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is sounding the alarm over raises and bonuses Crown Corporation executives received during the pandemic. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has met with U.S. President Joe Biden in Mexico City. The pair spoke briefly to reporters. Trudeau and Biden are getting set to meet with Mexican President Manuel Lopez Obrador to kick off the North American Leaders Summit. The three are expected to discuss issues including irregular migration, trade and climate change. There are tremendous things that we can uh, build on here at home. Uh, North America is the largest free trading bloc in the world, larger even than the European Union. Uh, we have a tremendous amount uh, to contribute to the world uh, in uh, goods and services, but also in technologies and solutions that the world really needs. And our capacity to work together has brought us to places of extraordinary success, but at a time of disruption around the world, a time of very real challenges, uh, we can and must be doing even more. Later in the day, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau talked about concerns from business leaders who say they want governments to start thinking about North America as a unified trade and business bloc in the spirit of the European Union. We almost lost the ground. And the Mexican government and me and my government in Canada worked very, very hard to try and convince the American administration at the time how important that trade with friends, integrated supply chains, reliable partnerships, and continental approach to building opportunities for our citizens was. And I was pretty convincing, and I know the Mexican government worked very, very hard to make that point as well, but we couldn't have done it without the business leaders and the labor leaders in this room who understood deeply that it was a matter of individual and shared prosperity. Political reporter Brian Lilly says Albertans appear to have a serious issue with the Trudeau government right now. It has a lot to do with the Liberals wanting Alberta to transition away from the oil and gas sector. Lilly says Trudeau will be discussing a number of issues with his federal counterparts, including carbon capture, electric vehicles and the energy sector. They'll be talking about what the issues that we just discussed, the uh, the carbon capture and storage, the electrical vehicle uh, tax credit. Um, they'll be talking about energy. You know, it's interesting, the United States going around the world looking for energy. They're looking at everything except um, a pipeline that could come from Canada. Um, they're looking at everything but that. So, you know, will Justin Trudeau be bringing that up? Probably not. Make sure you catch the full interview with political reporter Brian Lilly coming up after business news. You know, there are reports that Via Rail handed out bonuses, raises and lavish executive pay during the COVID-19 pandemic. At the time, the company allegedly lost hundreds of millions of dollars while Ottawa approved a $187.5 million bailout for the Crown Corporation. To talk about this in more detail is the federal director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, Franco Terzano, joins us now from Ottawa. Franco, a large number of Canadian taxpayers are not happy hearing the news. No, taxpayers should be outraged. Uh, Via Rail handed out $14.7 million in bonuses and raises during the pandemic, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Look at the lavish pay they're giving executives, which range between $270,000 up to $482,000. And the CEO is getting a $45,000 perk to use on a car allowance or sports and social club memberships. Now, remember, uh, during the pandemic, the feds approved a $187 million bailout uh, for VIA, and over the last five years, VIA has lost about $1.6 billion. And over those same five years, VIA has taken about $2.5 billion from taxpayers. Now, do you have some numbers as to bonuses that were given out to other Crown Corporations? Well, unfortunately, other Crown Corporations are rewarding themselves for failure. 
The Bank of Canada handed out $45 million in bonuses and raises during the pandemic and as inflation took off. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation handed out nearly $60 million in bonuses and raises when Canadians were struggling to afford homes. Destination Canada handed out bonuses and raises as well when the industry it's supposed to be marketing, the tourism sector, was locked down, and the CBC handed out $51 million in bonuses and raises during the pandemic. So it's it's past time that these government organizations stop rewarding themselves for failures with our tax dollars. Thanks so much for your time, Franco. That was Franco Terrazano, Federal Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining us from Ottawa. Defence Minister Nita Nand explained in more detail why Canada is moving forward with a deal to purchase 88 F-35 fighter jets to replace its ageing CF-18s. The decision represents an about-face by the Liberals after they initially said they were not interested in using taxpayer money to purchase the aircraft. It is the most advanced fighter on the market and it is the right aircraft for our country. The F-35 provides pilots with enhanced intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities, greatly improving their situational awareness and survivability in today's high threat operational environment. Canada's new fleet of 88 jets is being acquired in tranches, starting with an initial tranche of 16. We expect the first four aircraft to be delivered in 2026, the next six in 2027, the subsequent six in 2028, with the full fleet to arrive in time to enable the phase-out of the CF-18s by the end of 2032. When it comes to the world's most powerful passports, it appears as though the Japan leads the way. That's according to new numbers from the Henley Passport Index. For the fifth year in a row, Japan is number one since Japanese citizens can visit an astonishing 193 destinations out of 227 visa-free zones. South Korea and Singapore were tied for second place, enjoying a visa-free score of 192 destinations. Germany and Spain were tied for number three with 190. The United States and United Kingdom remain in sixth and seventh spots with scores of 187 and 186 respectively. As for Canada, we finished tied with Australia, Greece and Malta and number eight with a score of 185. Now the worst country was the Taliban-led Afghanistan with a score of just 27 destinations. Around 35,000 Canada Revenue Agency workers are getting set to walk off the job. In a release, the Public Service Alliance of Canada and the Union of Taxation Employees say talks broke down over wages and remote work. Strike votes will take place January 31st to April 7th. Workers at the CRA have been without a contract for more than a year now. The union declared an impasse back in September. The Public Service Alliance of Canada represents more than 165,000 federal public service workers. Many say outside of the rising cost of living, they're also concerned about an improper work-life balance and the contracting out of public service jobs. Well, it was great to experience above seasonal values in central Alberta and southern Alberta once again today. Jeanette Rocher is now with an early peak of the forecast. Jeanette, we may even see some double-digit plus temperatures just in time for the weekend. Yeah, you're right, Hal. We are expecting highs of 12 and 10 degrees by this Friday and Saturday. Uh, so that's great news. But even without those double digits, we're still doing pretty good for this week. Uh, actually, today in Lethbridge, we were the hot spot in Alberta earlier this afternoon. We reached up to 7.6, which was higher than our expected high of 5 degrees. And now into tomorrow, Wednesday, that's where the situation gets a little bit different. Uh, we are going to dip down into the minuses there. Minus three, the high, going to feel a little bit chillier with that wind chill. We're expecting a 15 kilometer per hour wind before we get back into the plus temperatures. And I'll have all those details coming up for you later on in the show. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Lethbridge fire crews responded to a blaze in the 1100 block of 19th Street North early Tuesday morning. Crews from four stations were able to put out the fire on the main floor of the house. Four people were transported to the hospital with smoke inhalation and other injuries. Unfortunately, one pet died at the scene, but another was rescued. Damage is estimated at $200,000, and the cause of the fire is still under investigation. A partnership between the Lethbridge Senior Citizens Organization and Drive Happiness now offers a senior-assisted transportation program for a small fee. 
Those looking to use the service must be registered as a rider and everything is prearranged. Officials at the LSCO is reminding us that it's not a taxi service. Aren't a whole lot of options as far as um, volunteer drivers. And just with the amount of seniors in our community um, that needed low cost effective transportation, drive happiness was um, an easy in for us. They uh, are very, very involved and they really love what they're doing for seniors throughout Alberta. Sabah says they're still in need of more volunteers and they're looking for those who have kind of a flexible schedule. If you can help out, you're asked to reach out to the LSCO through their website. The 2022 Christmas bird count yielded some pretty big numbers for the spotting of our feathered friends. Video journalist Micah Quinn chatted with Ken Orich, the organizer of the event, about the history of the Christmas bird count and the specific breeds that have flown into our region. Mallards and Canada geese were just a few of the bird species that were heard during the 2022 Christmas bird count. Ken Orich has been coordinating the annual event with the Lethbridge Naturalist Society since 2010. He says it's the 123rd year for the Christmas bird count, and prior to 1900, it was an annual event to figure out who could shoot the most birds and get the highest kill count. In uh, 1900, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Frank Chapman he was uh, just one of the members of the new formed Audubon Society. And he said, why don't we count birds instead of kill them? And there began the Christmas, annual Christmas bird count. Now the bird count goes on around the world, and Lethbridge has been participating since 1983. In 2022, 40 bird species were tallied, with the average over the years coming in at 43. Orich highlighted new bird species that were observed during the count, including the spotting of the first ever green-winged teal from a laundry list of 12,807 individual birds that were counted in Lethbridge. We had our uh, uh, highest number of golden eagles ever recorded, three. Our previous highs of two were in 2004, 2012, 2018, and 2020. So our bald eagles are remaining pretty strong. We had 38 tallied this year. Uh, we also set a new high record of uh, 65 gray partridge, which uh, beat the previous high of 52 set in 2006. A total of 58 participants formed 25 teams, counting 31 of the 39 areas within Lethbridge city limits and six surrounding country areas. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Still waiting to see one of those bald eagles here in the city. You may remember the name Arthur Pulowski, the Calgary street preacher who was jailed for breaking COVID-19 restrictions. Well, the pastor has turned to politics to fight a system he says has failed so many Albertans. Pulowski became the leader of the Independence Party in September of last year. You'll see his Independence Party on the ballot this May. He says a referendum on our independence is what the province really needs right now. We, what we need is we need to give voice back to the people. I have been all my life a strong advocate for referendum. In other words, I want to give that decision not to just few elected politicians, but to you, the people. What's wrong with us that we have given all the power to just a handful of people that are wiping us out, destroying us, and we have no say? I want that decision to come from you. What? Do you want? Do you want to be a separate country? Do you want to have independence? Do you want to have your own pension? Do you want to have your own resources? Do you want to tap in into your own resources? Do you want to be, do business with other countries as well or with our neighbors, uh, you know, uh, down the border? That's up to the people. So I want to do referendums. Every year, Albertans should have a say on key issues. Make sure you catch the full colorful interview with Arthur Pulowski and BCN's Jeanette Roche coming up in the second half of our program. A teacher in Virginia remains in stable condition after being shot in her classroom by a six-year-old student on Friday. Police say the teacher is a hero. Abigail is a 25-year-old teacher and she is a trooper. She is a hero. Mrs. Zwerner was providing class instruction and the six-year-old child uh, displayed a firearm, pointed it, pointed it at her and fired one round. There was no physical uh, struggle or fight. She was providing instruction to her class. She suffered a gunshot wound, um, 
but she was still able to get all of her students out of that classroom. From the video surveillance we have of the, of the hallway, you can see the students running out of that classroom across the hall into, and I would, I'm estimating about 17 to 20 students out of that classroom across all into other classrooms. Mrs. Warner was the last person to leave that class. Residents in Sacramento, California were cleaning up and surveying the damage caused by heavy rain and powerful winds. The storm knocked down tall trees throughout the state capitol, crushing both homes and vehicles. Two nights ago, there were some pretty extreme winds through the area. Um, as you can see, the pretty big tree got pushed over by the wind. This is one of like many. This is not the only one in the area. Saturday night, we were both sleeping and the wind was getting really bad. And a first a branch hit our house and then we got up and we're, we're watching outside the window and both of the trees here are it's blowing back and forth really crazy. So we were debating on whether or not we wanted to stay in the house and before we could make a decision, both trees fell, one on our house and one on our neighbor's house. Uh, some very powerful winds. Well, normally here in Lethbridge, we have some pretty powerful winds as well, but not lately. Just mild temperatures, lots of sunshine, and a few clouds. And it should be above seasonal as we get closer to the weekend as well. A complete look at the weather picture is coming up. It was so nice to have a temperature above the freezing mark once again today in Lethbridge. Jeanette Rocher is now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, we may even see double digit plus temperatures as we get closer to the weekend. Yeah, and I'm so excited for that. Look at those temperatures. Come Friday and Saturday, we are seeing those double digits. So up to 12 on Friday, Saturday looking at a high of 10 degrees. Uh, but before we get there, we're gonna have this little anomaly <laughs> is what I like to call it for Wednesday. We're going to be dipping down into the minuses again. Uh, with that 15 kilometer per hour wind, it will feel more like minus 12 tomorrow. But then we get back up into the pluses, so it's not so bad. Uh, Thursday, we're looking at sunshine, seven degrees the high, and then we hit that 12 degree mark on Friday, up to 10 degrees on Saturday all the way down to two on Sunday and then dipping down into the minuses again next Monday with partly cloudy skies and minus three as the high. Okay, so average high for this time of year, minus two, average low, minus 14 to 12 degrees. That was our high temperature on this day back in 1941. And in 1974, it was the chilliest, which was freezing, minus 37. 826, that's when the sun rose this morning, the sun set this evening at 4.52 p.m., giving us eight hours and 26 minutes of daylight. Days getting longer. Okay, nine degrees the high in Victoria tomorrow, looking at a chance of showers. Also a 60K wind in the Juan de Fuca Strait, 20 to 40K winds otherwise. Vancouver sitting at nine degrees, looking at a 60% chance of showers, 20 to 40K winds as well. Minus seven the high in Edmonton tomorrow, and minus five in Calgary with a mix of sun and cloud. Now, as we look to the rest of the prairies here, we're seeing partly cloud skies but fog dissipating in the morning in both Saskatoon and Regina tomorrow. Minus 12 the high for Saskatoon tomorrow and minus 14 in Regina. Minus 7 the high in Winnipeg. Winnipeg also looking at periods of light snow as we look to the central part of the country. Toronto seeing a mix of flurries and freezing drizzle high of 2 degrees. Minus 7 the high in Ottawa looking at some flurries there and minus 7 the high in Montreal. The partly cloudy skies over to Atlantic Canada now. Here we are seeing lots of sunshine, should be lovely. Minus five the high in Fredericton, minus three in Halifax, minus six the high in Charlottetown. Now St. John's sitting there at minus three with a 40% chance of flurry. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Today's weather report is brought to you by Ridge Utilities, providing competitive rates for electricity, natural gas, and internet, while investing back in communities across southern Alberta. Some economists are predicting that the Canadian housing market will bottom out sometime this year. They say the combination of inflation and rising interest rates is having a major impact on housing affordability. Some are predicting that home sales will drop to 2,001 levels before returning to positive territory in 2024. They say home prices will continue to drop around 20% in some of the country's largest markets, including Vancouver and Toronto, along with some large price drops in the Maritimes. The World Bank is warning that the global economy will come close to a recession this year, led by weaker growth in the United States, China and Europe. 
The bank slashed its forecast for global growth to 1.7% this year. The previous projection was 3%. While it says the U.S. and Canada may avoid a recession this year, it predicts global weakness will pose another headwind for North American businesses and consumers on top of high prices and more expensive borrowing rates. The Environmental Protection Agency says it has reached an agreement with a Canadian-based pipeline operator to clean up a spill that dumped 14,000 bathtubs worth of crude oil into a rural Kansas creek. The agency says the December 7th rupture of the Keystone Pipeline affected 5.6 kilometres of a creek as it flows through pasture land in Washington County. The order requires Calgary-based TC Oil to recover oil and oil-contaminated soil and vegetation to contain the further spread of oil in the creek. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 41 points on the day to finish at 19,898. The Dow was up 186 points to 33,704. The S&P 500 was up 27 on the day to 39.19. And the Nasdaq was up 106 points to 10,742. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 49 cents to 75.12 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 27 cents to 364 US. Gold was even on the day at 1877.04 US an ounce. And silver was down a cent to 2360 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $12.11 per bushel. Barley's at 960. Canola's at 19.27, and corn is at $11.22 per bushel. Live cattle February contract was unchanged at 157.88. Feeder cattle January contract was up 68 cents to 184.30, and lean hogs February contract was down a dollar to 79.80. The Canadian dollar was even over the past 24 hours at 74.48 US. Recapping one of our top stories, around 35,000 Canada Revenue Agency workers are getting set to walk off the job. In a release, the Public Service Alliance of Canada and the Union of Taxation Employees say talks broke down over wages and remote work. Strike votes will take place January 31st through April the 7th. Workers at the CRA have been without a contract for more than a year. There's a lot of tension between the UCP and the federal government right now. Some of it has to do with the Trudeau Liberals saying Alberta needs to transition away from oil and gas in the energy sector. Political reporter Brian Lilly will have details for us in just a moment. Listen, if you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. The City of Lethbridge is holding an event called Community Conversations on January 18th at the NMAX Centre beginning at 3 p.m. All Lethbridge residents are invited to attend this gathering to learn more about city projects and to give feedback on future initiatives. Plus, there will be free public skating, a big equipment exhibit, concession samples and door prizes. It's a great opportunity to help build a strong and connected community and improve the city we call home. For more information, visit lethbridge.ca. The Interfaith Food Bank is looking for volunteers to help in administration, warehouse, and kitchen. The commitment is three to four hours, once or twice a week. Through your help, you'll be providing food security in our community and enjoy a sense of purpose by serving others. For details on volunteering, contact Bill at volunteer at interfaithfoodbank.ca or by calling 403-320-8779. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is looking at putting forward legislation to encourage Alberta to transition away from the energy sector. This has infuriated many right here in our province, since oil and gas is a large part of how we generate revenue and beef up equalization payments to support some of the other provinces in need. Now to talk about this in more detail is political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, who joins us once again from Toronto. Now Brian, it appears as though the PM has been taking a few shots at Alberta which has not been sitting well with Premier Daniel Smith and the UCP caucus. Yeah, he was giving an interview to Reuters at the start of the year, and he he went off on Alberta in a very strange way because it's not the way he would talk about any other province. Um, so I understand why Albertans are so frustrated. Uh, look, 
he's talking about how the political class in Alberta doesn't care about the environment, doesn't want to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You talk to the energy sector, you know, I've been doing it for a decade, you've been doing it a long time. You talk to uh, politicians, you know, you listen to, to Premier Daniel Smith, and, and I saw her on TV just the other day talking about how she wants Alberta to have the greenest barrels. That was the term she used. We want to have the greenest barrels in the world. And, and that was before Trudeau had made his comments, uh, or at least before they were public, I believe. And, and she's talking in this way. And Trudeau is just dismissive because it's someone who is on another side politically from him, who he doesn't have a good relationship with, and decides that he's got to go all in on attack on them. It's not leadership. It's not the way it should happen. You know, most Canadians would actually like to see our political leaders work together for the most part. Now, look, both in Alberta and in Quebec, taking a shot at Ottawa is a surefire way for a provincial politician to boost themselves. But when it comes down to getting things done, people still want both levels of government to work together, not fight, not get in the way of each other. And that appears to be what Trudeau's doing now. And you talk about this green transition. Well, there's the Canadian Green Growth Fund and Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christy Freeland was being grilled over that the other day at a Senate committee over the fact that there's $2 billion in the fall economic statement for this. And it's to buy shares in a corporation that doesn't exist to try and attract private money to pay for this green transition. And it's not even set up. They're putting money into getting Alberta off of oil and gas before they even know what they're doing. It's quite frustrating on all sides. Brian, let's talk about another hot button issue that impacts so many provinces, and that's health care. And now Canada's premiers want more funding to support our health care. The prime minister so far has said no. Why not? Well, he said no, despite the fact that in 2015, when he was first elected, he called the funding formula that he's held to this entire time a cut. I, I don't know if you recall, but he was going around saying there's a $36 billion Harper cut to health care. Uh, of course, that Harper cut to health care didn't take effect until 2017. Um, the Harper government had said, look, we're, we're increasing funding at about 6% a year plus uh, population plus inflation. That's too much. We'll make it 3% plus population and inflation. Trudeau called that a cut, said it was uh, disastrous, and then adopted it. Because, as I said, it didn't take effect until 2017, two years after he was in office. Um, he has said that he would work with premiers. He has refused to meet with them as a group on this. When premiers have raised ongoing funding issues on the many calls that he's had with them about COVID-19 and the pandemic, he says now's not the time. But when Trudeau's asked about it, he says, I've had more meetings than anybody else about health care. Yeah, but when they raise it on those calls, he says, no, not now. Trudeau wants to have his cake and eat it. He wants to be seen as the savior of health care. He doesn't want to put forward the money. Now he's trying to put conditions in ways that the premiers won't accept. Are, are premiers willing to say that, yes, they will be accountable to their people on how that, that money is spent? Absolutely. But Alberta has the, uh, the youngest population among the provinces in the country, whereas somewhere like Nova Scotia has one of the older populations. So there's going to be different needs for the healthcare system. And having Ottawa dictate that from bureaucrats out at Tunney's Pasture isn't the way to do it. Now, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith says she may, in fact, go ahead with her own health care reforms. What would they potentially look like, Brian? Well, all of the premiers are looking at different ways to deliver health care. And I can tell you that here in Ontario, uh, Premier Doug Ford has been talking about an expanded role of the private sector. Now, that doesn't mean privatizing who pays for your care. This is not about going to a private insurance model. This is about saying, look, you, you need cataract surgery. We'll use the uh, the eye care, private eye care center that's already there that has capacity. You need knee or hip surgery, and it's a simple operation, we will use facilities that exist that are already performing operations outside of the public system and use them inside the public system to clear away backlogs. Scott Moe has been talking about similar things in Saskatchewan. I know that Danielle Smith is saying that she will look at those types of uh, procedures, those types of uh, potential opportunities, but that she will also look at what the province actually needs. If you can't measure, you can't plan. And a lot of things we just don't know in our healthcare system. You know, what is a procedure actually costing us? 
How long is the actual wait time? We have vague notions of this, but the actual data on healthcare, Alberta is actually better than other provinces from my experience, but it's still not where it should be considering the amount of money that goes into it. So she's looking at a bunch of reforms that will change the way that it works. As far as I can tell, she is not talking about going to a away from the, the single payer system, which for guys our age, Hal, you know, philosophically, we cannot be on board with it. But once you crest over 50, trying to buy uh, private health insurance for yourself uh, the, in an American style system wouldn't work here. That's a, a non-starter. It's not happening no matter how much the, uh, the people that want everything unionized, everything paid for by and performed by pri uh, public sector unions, despite their cries, that's not what's happening here. But they are looking at different ways of delivering. And I can tell you on that front, when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was here in Ontario and Doug Ford said to him in front of the cameras, the current system isn't working, the status quo can't continue, Justin Trudeau agreed with them and didn't push back on Ford's plans. You know, a big issue for us here in the province as well, as it is in many provinces, is the shortage of doctors. I don't have a doctor. My doctor moved to Holland. I talked to some of my coworkers as well in the newsroom. Their doctors left, went to other provinces, went down to the states. So yeah, the shortage of physicians is a major issue, not just here, but I know across the country. Brian, let's talk about carbon capture, ca carbon capture for just a moment here. Now, the issue of carbon capture and storage is, as you've said in the past, part of Canada trying to keep up with the United States and their subsidies for this technology or mass of subsidies for electric vehicles. Do you think this is wise to offer huge subsidies to industry? Uh, probably not, but the Trudeau government seems to be going that way. And this is something that uh, U.S. President Joe Biden included in, uh, oddly, what he calls his inflation control package. Uh, he's got all these subsidies going to the energy sector, going to the electric vehicle uh, sector. He wants to subsidize the consumers to purchase electric vehicles. Look, uh, Electric vehicles aren't for everyone. They're not for every location. They're not for every uh, use of a you know, motor vehicle. But the, the industry is moving towards electric for your average daily commuter, the average daily person. Yeah, electric is where the industry is moving with or without government intervention. Um, but do we need to have it subsidized? Some provinces have been doing that. Others haven't. The federal government has a, a modest one. Um, but it costs, you know, overall, it costs taxpayers a fair amount of money. Joe Biden and the Democrats in the United States want to offer huge subsidies. Now, the Trudeau government, thanks to the help of some Democrat senators, were able to uh, change the way that it's being offered so that it doesn't punish Canadian-made cars or Mexican-made cars and violate the, the free trade agreement. But it's still coming in in a massive way. And so the Trudeau government thinks that whether it's that or whether it's the massive subsidies for the energy sector to get into carbon capture and storage, that they've got to match them. This is going to cost us in a huge way. And, and you know, it's funny how governments offer a tax cut and people call it a race to the bottom. And we shouldn't give all these companies tax cuts and, and, and match the tax cuts that other jurisdictions are giving. We should keep taxes high. Why? So that we can give those tax uh, those tax dollars directly to companies or directly to consumers, and that's what's going to happen here. I have great concerns about how much this is going to cost the Canadian Treasury because the Trudeau government hasn't exactly laid out what their plans will be or what the, the bottom line hit will be. Brian, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Mexico City meeting with U.S. President Joe Biden and Mexico's President Obrador. The Three Amigos Summit, as it's being called, I guess they'll be talking about business, including what, softwood lumber? They'll be talking about what the issues that we just discussed, the uh, the carbon capture and storage, the electrical vehicle uh, tax credit. Um, they'll be talking about energy. You know, it's interesting, the United States going around the world looking for energy. They're looking at everything except um, a pipeline that could come from Canada. Um, they're looking at everything but that. So, you know, will Justin Trudeau be bringing that up? Probably not. But there's a lot of other trade irritants, and softwood lumber is one. The Biden administration doubled the uh, the tariffs on Canadian softwood lumber. They are looking at country of origin labeling for agricultural products like beef, which has to be a huge concern in Alberta. Now, that seems to have been put on pause, but the beef ranchers in the United States that want that back in place, whether it's for, for beef or for hogs, they have the president's ear and he is open to them. 
that has to be a concern that the Canadian government is raising while they're at this uh, uh, at this summit. Uh, but again, you know, it, the trade irritants between Canada and the United States for anyone that thought that the, they would go away under Joe Biden, they're actually worse. It's just that you don't hear about it as much because Donald Trump isn't there. Um, it, it's not just a partisan thing. Trump was his own circus. Trump made sure that you knew what was going on. Biden sticks the knife in you with a smile. Brian, sadly, we've seen five police officers killed in the line of duty in Canada since last September. Now, you wrote about a statement from the biggest police associations in the country last week where they said enough is enough and they want changes. Is our federal government really not doing enough on crime? They're not. Uh, and of course, they, they just recently passed a bill that reduced mandatory minimum sentences for serious gun crimes. Now, this was put forward by Justice Minister Lametti as helping people who made a just an honest mistake. And we can all understand that, how people making youthful, honest mistakes or stupid, you know, acting stupid when they're young. We've all been there. Uh, but the mandatory minimums they got rid of in many cases on the gun crime side, there was no mandatory minimum for your first offense. It was a mandatory minimum for your second and third offense. And we're talking about crimes like extortion with a gun, robbery with a gun, uh, gun smuggling, gun trafficking. So you're selling illegal guns, uh, carrying prohibited weapons, things like that. And they got rid of those mandatory minimums. They also uh, brought in something in 27 or 2019, sorry, called Bill C-75, and it reformed the way that bail is handed out. This is now starting to really, we're really starting to feel the effects of this. Everyone from uh, Toronto's mayor, John Tory, uh, to Ontario Premier Doug Ford, uh, Murray Rankin, the uh, British Columbia NDP uh, Solicitor General, saying this is a problem. Police chiefs across the country saying this is a problem because we've got this perp and release uh, system. Somebody commits a crime, they're arrested by the cops, bail is the default option, even if it's a serious crime. We've had a bunch of, of murders. The OPP officer that was killed while responding to a car in the ditch call, shot and killed. The man now charged with that murder was someone who was out on bail for gun crimes and assaulting a police officer after getting out of jail for an armed robbery with a gun and not following his parole conditions. So, you know, we can point to stories like this across the country. This is a problem. And the police say they want changes on the bail front. They didn't give specific recommendations, but say they will be coming. Five police officers killed in four months. They said that is unprecedented and it needs to stop and governments need to listen. The Trudeau government's been very soft on crime. Even if provinces want to get tough, their hands are, are tied. And in many cases, so are the hands of judges and justices of the peace because of the changes the Trudeau government has brought in. They need to get their act together. Dr. Jordan Peterson has been making headlines for the past few weeks over his fight with the College of Psychologists of Ontario. Brian is facing a license suspension for refusing to take social media retraining. Now, you've read the documents and you've chatted with Dr. Peterson about this. Is he facing prosecution or is this maybe more a case of political persecution? Well, it's a prosecution due to political persecution, actually. That's probably the best way to describe it. Uh, Look, Jordan Peterson um, was a psychologist who operated both in academic and clinical terms. He had a practice. He saw patients. He practiced for years without any issue until he became a, a public figure, until he took a political stance that was outside of what was considered acceptable by academia and by many in the media. And since then, he said he has been inundated with complaints, and they're never from patients. It's never about his patients. It's always someone who disagrees with him politically. So I reviewed the investigator's report. I hesitate to call it an investigation. They looked over a bunch of tweets. One of them was retweeting Ben Shapiro, who put out a bunch of facts. They're not dispute. They are facts about COVID-19. This was on December 31st, 2021, saying things like, the most of the people going into hospital are going in with COVID, not because of it. That masks don't, a cloth mask doesn't stop transmission. That's true. We know that. Um, that you can still uh, spread COVID when you're vaccinated. Shapiro just tweeted that out. Jordan Peterson retweeted it with approving comments, saying, let people get back to their lives. He retweeted Pierre Polyev, 
same thing. Polyev was tweeting about Government of Canada um, COVID restrictions. Peterson offered support in saying these need to end. That has nothing to do with psychology. And you can dispute the efficacy of the, uh, the restrictions in place. But I'll tell you, within a couple of weeks of Peterson uh, t you know, showing support for that on Twitter, governments were backing away from those measures because they weren't needed. Why? Because things had changed. Um, so, you know, the fact that he's being prosecuted over that or, um, you know, saying there is no Nazi culture or white supremacist culture prevalent in Canada, that, again, doesn't have to do with psychology. So it is very much when you look at the collection of tweets and the comments he made on Joe Rogan's podcast about climate change, and those are the things, and I laid it out in an article at the Toronto Sun, you can read them all yourself, and I cite from the investigator's report, those are the things that led to the investigation being launched, nothing else. And none of that has to do with psychology, it's all politics. It's almost like people can't have opinions anymore. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal. When you hear the name Arthur Pulowski, you know there's probably some kind of a controversy going on. He's the founder of Calgary Street Church, which has been ministering to the poor and addicted in downtown Calgary for many years. He's very outspoken and has been arrested many times for his various protests against pandemic restrictions, as well as taking part in the trucker convoy demonstrations. He's now also venturing into provincial politics, starting up a new party called the Independence Party. Arthur Pulowski joins me now. Art, thanks so much for being here, and I understand you're joining us from Calgary, where I believe you're still under house arrest? Yes, thank you so much for having me in. Uh, you are correct. I am still on house arrest. I am still facing 10 and a half years of imprisonment uh, by the UCP government, and that's why um, one of the reasons that I actually joined the political realm uh, when I was in a solitary confinement, I realized uh, those people will not allow me to just be a pastor. So I have to I have to stand up, rise up. And if they will not allow me to be a pastor, I will become a pastor politician. And what was chasing me yesterday, I shall be chasing tomorrow. That was one of the reasons. Okay, wow. Well, I mean, you've got a lot going on there. Can you maybe explain why you formed the Independence Party of Alberta? What are your beefs? What's the mission of the party? Well, we have been observing our politics for the past decades, and it's it's going from bad to worse, corruption, no accountability, no checks and balances whatsoever. Uh, we are missing billions of dollars from our coffers. The politicians will say one thing before the election and completely ignore us after the election. And I have been observing this for years, and I think... Uh, like majority of Albertans, I am sick and tired of the flip-flopping politicians that will lie in your face. They are uh, incredible speakers. I have to admit that they know how to lie, uh, but then nothing comes out of their words. So I think what we need is completely brand new party, grassroots. Uh, we do not have politicians in our party. We are just like you. We are your neighbors. And we are ready to clean the swamp. I mean, I talked to hundreds of people uh, just uh, the other night, and I said, hey, we have a plumbing problem. We have the biggest sewer problem in the history of our beloved Canada. Well, I can be your plumber. I have a big plunger, and um, hire me. I'll clean your swamp. Okay. Uh, now, Art, uh, I think that you would have to admit that as a fledgling political party, you're, you might be unlikely to see any candidates elected this May, but are you doing this simply to draw attention to the issues at hand, or do you see yourself growing the party and eventually winning some seats down the road? Oh, my friend, you have not been paying attention uh, in the past few months. We have thousands of new members. People are getting excited about the idea of someone that have been proving over and over again that I mean what I say. When Artur Polosky says something, uh, that means I'm going to 
do it, even if it means me ending up in prison. As you know, uh, if you were following my story, I have been arrested 16 times, over 340 citations, over 100 court cases. Uh, when I was in the solitary confinement, when they put me stripped naked, metal cages, you name it, Five inmates testified already that the guards were giving them incentives to murder me. Um, well, I was pressured by the Crown prosecutors to say, I'm sorry for being part of the truck convoy. And I said that thousands of times, and I'm going to say it again. Seeing, being part of the truck convoy was one of the best things I've ever done on this soil. It was amazing. It was beautiful. I'm not sorry. The only regret I have is that I did not spend more time with our amazing Canadians, uh, not less. So uh, what I saw was uh, amazing patriotism, love that I have not seen on this side of the border. I've seen people coming together from every walk of life, so every Cree, uh, young and old, children bringing their pets, their dogs, their horses. I mean, feeding each other, praying with each other, singing with each other, hugging each other. It was absolutely amazing. I do not reg regret that. You see, I am not your typical politician. I am a pastor. I will never apologize for being a Christian. I will not apologize that I'm a pastor. And if you want a pastor that actually says what he means, well, I, I am your man. And I think it resonates with people. People are signing to the Independence Party left and right. Wherever we show up right now, it's hundreds of people that come. And people are excited. I thought that me being a pastor is going to be a hindrance. Actually, it's opposite. We had William Oberhardt, a pastor, politician, premier of Alberta. 350,000 people were listening to him every week as he preached from the pulpit on Sunday. Then Manning came. 600,000 people were listening to his sermons. He was the longest serving politician in the Commonwealth during that time. Well, we had two pastors, premiers. Well, it's time for a third one. Okay, now Art, maybe tell our viewers, what's the difference between your party as compared to other separatist parties in Alberta? Well, we're not separatists. We want independence. Now, put it this way. Um, you are married to a very abusive husband. He is raping you, he's beating you up, and he's stealing money. And then the next day you come to him and say, hey, honey, I married you, but I don't have even enough to feed our children. And boom, you get another beating. And this is going on for over 100 years. Even before Alberta joined the Confederation, the, uh, the East has been raping us, stealing from us, and destroying us. We want independence. You see, people are scared. The enemy is using the fear tactics. It says, hey, if you separate, you're going to be wiped out. You don't stand a chance. Well, listen to me. We want what Quebec has. Quebec has independence. They have their own pension. They have their own police. They are free, truly they have a free province. We want what, the, what they have a little bit more as well. If they could do it, why can't we? Are they smarter than Albertans? Are they more, you know, capable than Albertans? I don't think so. I think they were brave enough to say, hey, we want our freedom. That's what I want for Albertans. I want Albertans to dig in into the resources. I mean, we are sleeping on oil. We can become truly Saudi Arabia of North America. I want to give incentives to the people for their own oil. Why everything is stolen from us? Why we pay taxes uh, that are killing us and destroying the future of our children? Let's revive our economy. Let's dig what's rightfully ours. God has given it to us. And we are not able to do this because the federal government is destroying us, is wiping us out. And independence is not a separatist movement. Independence is a message. I want to be independent. And I hope you also want to be independent as well. Independent from the government overreach. We should be free. God, you see, my Jesus is the biggest freedom fighter that ever walked on earth, he says, who comes to me is free indeed. The truth shall set the captives free. That's what I want for my fellow Albertans. Okay, so our, we know that you're a very strong believer in freedom. Uh, you call yourself Independence Party, but not separatist. But do you support Alberta separating? 
Well, we what we need is we need to give voice back to the people. I have been all my life a strong advocate for referendum. In other words, I want to give that decision not to just few elected politicians, but to you, the people. What's wrong with us that we have given all the power to just a handful of people that are wiping us out, destroying us, and we have no say? I want that decision to come from you. What do you want? Do you want to be a separate country? Do you want to have independence? Do you want to have your own pension? Do you want to have your own resources? Do you want to tap in into your own resources? Do you want to be- do business with other countries as well or with our neighbors uh, You know, uh, down the border? That's up to the people. So I want to do referendums. Every year, Albertans should have a say on key issues. And that's what I propose. Within the first year of forming a majority government, we will give you that right, that voice. And you will tell us what you want. I'm not going to tell you what I want and by forcing you to accept my uh, views. No, it's up to you. We all are in this together. And I believe that Albertans, it's time for Albertans to have their voice heard. So referendum. And we will see if we will get the document, because everything has to be done legally. I'm not talking about coup. I'm not talking about an armed resistance. Uh, far from it. I'm a Polish immigrant. I've seen the power of the solidarity movement. All of that was done without firing one shot. There's more of us than the villains, believe it or not. So I want to give that voice back. When I get that document, a legal document of the referendum, then we'll have a different position within the Confederation. And we will force the federal government to accept what Albertans want, not what Ontario or Quebec wants. Okay, well, you you mentioned pension and they're having your own pension. So I, I one of those inevitable questions that arises is that if Alberta were to separate, what guarantee is there that Albertans would get their pensions that they've paid into for so long? My God, if we have independence, my friends, you're going to have more, not less. You see, we do not have a money problem in our beloved nation. We have a spending problem. Those psychopaths, that's what they are. They are wasting our money left and right. And if you will not, if you're not paying attention, if you're not careful, you will not have a pension. The way the federal government is proceeding left and right is wiping your future, and not just your future, but the future of your children. You will have no pension. If we have independence, we have resources like no other nation on earth. Like I said, we can become Saudi Arabia of North America. We can we can be billionaires here uh, without a problem and people can prosper. So you will have more, not less. Do not believe the lie. They are lying to you, telling you that if you have independence, then you're going to have less, not more. That's a lie. You will have more. Why? Because now we are paying 55% in combined taxes. I mean, that's absolutely unbelievable that people are putting up with this. I want the lower taxes. I want to put a cap on the minimum wage that people would not have to pay taxes if they are, uh, you know, listen what is happening to us. People are struggling already. They cannot pay for their food. They cannot pay for their utilities. But we tax them anyway. How they're how they are they're not able, even if they wanted to, to get out of that hole. We gotta put a cap on this. If you're making sixty thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars combined, you don't pay taxes. We gotta leave that money within the family so they can survive another day. But what the government is doing right now is taxing us to death. And that's exactly what we're seeing left and right. So don't believe the lie that your pension will suddenly disappear. We got trillions upon trillions of dollars in the ground. Build a pipe. And if the if British Columbia doesn't want it, we will build it to Montana, to our neighbors. If Montana doesn't want it, we're going to sell it to other countries. Look at Europe. There is a crisis. There is energy crisis. Dig that stuff out of the ground. God has given it to us. Okay, I'm not going to use the word separate. <laughs> I'll just say if Alberta were to become independent. So you definitely believe that it's affordable for Alberta to become independent. I, you know, some people would ask that there's, of course, cost to creating our own military or a central banking system or a judicial system. The list goes on. You know, what about public health care? How would this work uh, without money coming in from the federal government? 
Well, 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 here is the problem. It's our money. The federal government is not giving us anything. Is we are being raped and robbed. We give billions upon billions of dollars to the federal government, and then with their mercy, so you know, so graciously, they give us a portion of our own money. I say, let's keep it all. Let's keep all for Albertans. After all, Albertan politicians should be for Albertans. So uh, we're going to have more, not less, because we will not be uh, being. We are not going to be robbed by the federal government. We need the referendum. We need a, a legal document that we can sit down with the federal government and renegotiate our part within the confederation. We cannot allow, you see, here is the, how the system works. We got British Columbia, Northwest Territory, Yukon, we have uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta. All of us combined together, we vote. But uh, all of us combined, we have less representation, less seats, if you will, uh, than Ontario alone. So every single time we combine together vote, we're being un uh, uh, outvoted uh, by the Ontario. Let's talk about the Supreme Court of Canada. We have nine judges. Seven of them are from the East. Every single time there is an issue uh, that should defend us, we are losing because the whole thing is rigged. It has been created in such a way that we don't stand a chance. That's why we need the referendum. Quebec did it. If it worked for them and they've lost, as you know, they've lost twice and yet they won. Imagine that. They've lost twice and they are the victorious ones. I say let's try it. If it worked for them, it will work for us as well. Well, Art, thanks so much for being with us today. We really appreciate hearing all about your party and uh, much success to you. Thank you so much. And I'm telling you, do not allow the enemy to scare you. They have been doing this for the past few years. I say to you, have hope that God is doing something powerful and join. Join other Albertans in this uh, amazing adventure of getting back what's rightfully ours, the independence. Be blessed. Thank you. Our Pulaski is the leader of the Independence Party. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks so much for watching.